Good afternoon. This is Between the Lines live at SanduskyRegister.com. I'm Matt Westerhold, Executive Editor of the Register. My guest today is uh, Dr. Stephanie Walls from BGSU Firelands College. We're going to talk about the just finished primary election and the one upcoming in the summer. Also on the program today is Angela LaRosa. She's an intern with the Sandusky Register this summer and she's been working real hard so she's going to be asking she's going to be leading this interview basically and I'm going to be available as well uh, and also in the audience is Jesse Opfer she's also a summer intern and also a no a Miami University student who is interning here at the register this summer Aaron Caldwell is producing this segment of Between the Lines which is brought to you by Serving our seniors for Erie County residents age 60 and better. If you need help, call Serving Our Seniors at 419-624-1856. Aaron Caldwell is here producing this segment of Between the Lines. Aaron, you want to say hello? Hello. And with that, we'll introduce our guest, Dr. Stephanie Walls from BGSU Firelands College, is to my immediate right. And Angela LaRosa to her right. And Jesse Opfer is in our studio audience along with, oh, I'd say, about 500 other people. With that, we'll get started. Angela, if you want to introduce yourself and say hello. Hi, I'm Angela. I'm an intern at Bowling Green State University uh, studying journalism. So, very excited to be here. And we're excited to have you here. And you're doing such a good job. You've been here about two weeks. Mm -hmm. And um, just finished up my second week. Yeah, and you're doing great. So, and Dr. Walsh, thank you for being back. Yeah. We always appreciate your insight on these things. And and uh, why don't you lead off with the first question? So I want to ask you about your views on the J.R. Majewski um, nomination. He's running against Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you think that race is going to go? What's your opinion on it? Well, I think, um, you know, in, in this type of election, even in a district that is maybe more competitive, um, the incumbent advantage is a lot to overcome. So, you know, what we learn in our study of electoral politics is that incumbents come into any election with a significant advantage over a challenger. And so in Marcy Kaptur, not only do we have an incumbent, but we have someone who's been serving since the early 80s. Um, and so, you know, for voters in this district, it's not just about voting, you know, one party over another, but there's a level of familiarity. She has, you know, an established base of support and she has at this point truly multiple generations of people um, who she has served and that that brings with it um, you know a certain degree of, of loyalty so not to diminish you know the the challenge that any opponent would bring um, but but I do know that incumbent advantage is a, a significant advantage to overcome. Do you think Majewski's gonna have a hard time like do you think it's gonna be a competitive race? Um, well I I don't know the last time that there was truly a, a competitive race. I mean... I don't remember any. Yeah, um, Captors won pretty handily. Um, and so, but that being said, we are truly in uncharted waters anymore. Um, and whereas a couple of years ago, I, I probably would have been comfortable saying pretty definitively, you know, that it wouldn't be competitive. Mm -hmm. Anymore, you know, you run a risk when, when you come down too hard, you know, um, in trying to predict uh, something one way or another. Were, um, were you surprised that uh, J.R. Majewski beat two more traditional candidates uh, in uh, uh, the representatives, the incumbent representatives in Ohio legislature, uh, Teresa Gavarone, State Senator Teresa Gavarone, and Carl Riedel? Were you surprised that he overtook their candidacies? I was. Um, I, I was particularly because my perception is that um, Gavarone is pretty well liked um, and and well regarded by Republican voters. Mm -hmm. So, but that being said, anytime and again, I would you know say especially in the last few years when you have a candidate um, who strays from the more traditional position, 
I do think that that can be more motivating for voters. So that being, meaning that a, a voter who may or may not have participated usually in a primary election might be more motivated to get out to vote for a, a candidate who maybe is a little less traditional. Um, and, and maybe, maybe you know, Gavarone supporters or, or more traditional Republican supporters, maybe they assumed falsely that she would those, win. yeah, that she would win. So I, I think it could be any combination. It would be interesting to, to, well, you can't really know, but if there had just been two candidates, if it had been Rito versus Majewski mm -hmm. or Gavarone yeah. versus Majewski, how that might have come up. Um, you know, because Riedel and Gavron probably split the reasonable vote, uh, the traditional Republican vote, and uh, Majewski was able to get the uh, non-traditional vote. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. Not having the numbers in front of me, right. I, I do think it's safe to say that, yeah, the traditional vote was kind of split or compromised because of the two candidates. Do you think uh, Captor is worried? I wouldn't imagine so, mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't think it, it's a time for any candidate to feel, you know, <laughs> you know, completely confident, you know, I, I but I, I think though, even in all these years of serving, I mean, she campaigns, she, yeah. you know, she reaches out to her constituents, yeah. um, you know, she's never struck me as a, as a representative or candidate who who takes that for granted. There was a, she was here for the groundbreaking at the State Theater, and it was a traditional groundbreaking photo, which, you know, I'm not keen on, because they're a little bit posed, you know, they put a, a layer of dirt on the I side saw wall. that. But she had down there, <laughs> yeah. still on that dirt. And she was here to celebrate that, so she's definitely always shows up, there's no doubt about that. Uh, Angela, what, what is your next question? Uh, so the next question I want to touch base on is the seven candidates running for the state senate seat. Mm -hmm. um, we, can, do you have any general um, comments about that? So what? after the primary, we have seven? No, no. Well, we have seven candidates. Oh, okay. <laughs> so <we have> seven <laughs> like, candidates. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Republican candidates. Gotcha. Okay. Um, <laughs> And they were they were grappling grappling for Trump's endorsement, yes. ultimately yes. getting JD Vance, who was nominated. So do you have any like um, just general comments about how that that, that side of the was, yeah. yeah? Well, the Republican primary for the U.S. Senate, yeah. which was uh, an unusual primary, wouldn't you say? Yes, definitely. <laughs> well, and and so you know another question I've got is you know why did the Republican primary get so much attention in the Democratic primary? did not. Um, but, I, you know, I think what, what happened on the Republican side is that the seat that is open um, is Portman's, and he is a Republican. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes, even though it's not a true incumbent advantage, sometimes the party of the outgoing person you know, feels like it's their seat, you know, it's their seat to keep because it belonged to a Republican and they're Republican. So I think that's one of the reasons why there was such a vast field of candidates um, vying for that, um, that nomination. Um, and, you know, I, I do know that there's, and it's not just in that race, you know, there's been a push kind of across the board by a, a number of Republicans to, to secure that endorsement from Trump. And what cu was curious to me and what I was interested to see was how that would be affected when Trump kind of publicly mashed two of the candidates' names together. Right, um, J.D. JD Mandel. Mandel. And I wondered if if that would create any confusion among voters, you know, like which which person um, had, had the nomination. Um, as far as, you know, how impactful that endorsement was, I think it's hard to say because mm -hmm. I think even going into this, J.D. Vance has name recognition because of the book that he wrote. Um, and so... And, and we know in the study of electoral politics that name recognition is, is really significant. So it's hard sometimes to tease apart um, exactly what's going on there. But I do think, though, that the, the number of candidates, um, you know, and the... I don't know, kind of the weight that the Republican Party in Ohio feels to keep that seat definitely was a motivator for a Republican turnout. Is, is in that, that, that's a pivotal race for the country. It is. Uh, because it's a fight for the Senate majority. Yeah. Uh, 
what do you think is going to happen? It's, it's uh, well, on the other side, it was Democrats. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it was Morgan Harper who was an interesting candidate, uh, to say the least. And then there was uh, Tim Ryan from Youngstown, and uh, the male candidate, the white male candidate. Now, I, I take nothing away from Tim Ryan. He worked for the burn pits legislation, and, and that was just recently... Looks like that's going through, according to our news coverage today. Now, there was a third candidate, too, wasn't there, uh, on the Democratic there side? Was, uh, there was, but it was an also ran. Yeah. Event. Whereas Morgan Harper was a serious candidate, mm -hmm. and uh, but uh, Tim Ryan won it big. Uh, what do you think that race is going to look like? Is it going to be competitive? It sure seems like it will. I think so. I mean, I, what's always interesting to me about a state like Ohio that has had one Republican senator and one Democratic senator for several years now is that it's arguably the same voters, right? You know, I mean, we have yeah, got, yeah. and and so, you know, they'll come out and support Sherry Brown, and voters will come out and support Rob Portman. And so, you know, this will be... I think a, a new opportunity to take the temperature of the Ohio voters in a different way yeah. um, because I, and I don't know if we'll get to this, but I mean, I think that um, gerrymandering has really affected the we tone. Are okay. To that. All right. So I'll, I'll put a pin in that. Um, <laughs> but, but this will be an opportunity to see with an open seat you know, where the voters are going to, to align. Um, I'm interested to see how Vance is going to campaign for the seat. You know, I think that on, I don't know, on, on some level, it seems that, you know, it's kind of in lines with wanting um, Donald Trump's endorsement. Um, it seems like candidates are just kind of defaulting to, you know, I'm a Trump Republican, and then it's left to us to figure out what that means. Um, so I'm curious to see if he'll take this opportunity to maybe drill down a little bit on issues that are specific and important to Ohioans so that we as voters really have the opportunity to genuinely compare the two candidates and what what their what their vision is for representing Ohio in the Senate. Don't you think he'll go left now? Uh, I mean like the uh, the governor of uh, Virginia, uh, the way he, he put the uh, thread through the needle by not quite being a Trumpster? Well, I, I mean, I think it's possible. The, the only reason I say that is because before Vance supported Trump, he didn't. Yeah. So yes. we do know. I love the way you said that. Before he supported Trump, he didn't. So we know that that's a more complex situation. So now that he's secured the nomination, it'll be interesting to see how he positions himself. And and I think that there's, I mean, there's merits to either yeah, either true. choice, mm -hmm. right? You know, some voters don't appreciate when candidates make too sharp a move right. to the center because they they feel it makes them seem ingenuine you know that they're just they're trying to move to the center to get votes um but but that is a strategy and, and ryan's doing it too he's moving toward the center i mean he's talking about china and, and battling china on imports and and so he's moving to the center too and maybe that's where ohioans are Yes, oh. arguably. Um, but there's also a strategy where, you know, you pull further to the, the outside and mm -hmm. see if that doesn't motivate voters. But I do think, given the overall breakdown of Ohio voters um, and just how we're situated politically, it seems to me it would be a better move to, to move to the center. You know, I, I think that um, I, I think that, that would be the, the better move. So it's going to be a center. It could be a center race for both candidates. Well, and it really, you know, and again, there's there's kind of pros and cons to that. If both candidates move to the center, it may make it more difficult for voters to be able to discern oh. which candidate better represents their position. For me, as a voter, I would just be so happy and relieved to, to see a, a genuine discussion of of issues, of issues, of issues. Um, you know, where I would be given the opportunity to assess truly which candidate has policy ideas and positions that would most closely align well, with mine. Talk for a moment about dark money because we couldn't even we couldn't even figure out how much money went into that Senate race. Uh, I mean, and is it are, 
is it possible to know how much money went into that center race? I mean, you can know what the candidates spent, but the uh, political action committees, can you even know what they spent and how they spent it? Or well, is it unknowable? I mean, I think you've kind of discovered this through experience. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so when, when I talk about the challenges to our country, you know, one thing that I talk about is gerrymandering. The other thing I talk about is campaign finance. And I, I think that the rollback of campaign finance regulations has created a, a major challenge um, to, to our political system because by design, we have expanded the role of money. And in the name of, of freedom, we have rolled back regulations, but at the end of the day, and, and maybe, maybe it's an unintended consequence, maybe it's an intended consequence, just depending on kind of your yeah. approach to life, um, <laughs> is that it, it is hard to track. And it is because it's no longer, I'm a candidate and let me show you my books. Right. You know, they and, still do that. So, oh, yes, but. But, but there's millions yes. and millions of other dollars. Those were the commercials everybody was yeah. seeing on TV. They weren't actually candidate commercials, although you, you, you couldn't wouldn't know. know. Uh, so that is it is frightening, I think. Well, and the amount of money that came in from out of state, mm. you know. So when you think about state elections, you know, you you think about like us as Ohio voters making a decision about our representation in Congress, and but then when you look at it and you see the money coming in from out of state, you know, again, depending on your take on the role of money in politics, it can lead you to some kind of grim conclusions yeah. about the control that we have as voters over the outcome of our own elections. Did you ever think we would be in this, I mean, did you ever envision what a mess it would be? Doesn't it seem to be really messy now? used to be more, well, it was always messy. Right. Uh, but is it more messy today? Yes. And, and I, I mean, I, I do believe that the, the decisions that led to, again, the rollback in campaign um, finance regulations, I, I thought those were tremendously significant decisions at the time they were made. I mean, mm -hmm. because going back to the early 1900s, you know, we have been engaging in campaign finance reform, you know, most significantly in the 1970s, um, you know, trying to to level the playing field as much as possible. But I mean, this is the Citizens United decision yeah. that we're talking about, which basically recognized that uh, PACs could, could support positions uh, which are disguised, they're disguised as positions, basically. Well, and it decided that corporations should be afforded the rights of individuals. So yeah. it was the idea of extending First Amendment protections to corporations. And now there's, I saw a news story this morning, you know, sort of caught it out of the, you know, wasn't really paying attention, but there's uh, an elephant in the Bronx Zoo that they're trying to extend civil rights to because it's been at the Bronx Zoo for 45 years and a group says it's being mistreated and it's actually gone to the I think it's gone to the New York Supreme Court is where it's at right now wouldn't that be wild and if you're going to give an animal civil rights I think the elephant is a perfect animal to start with but that's just my opinion I'm going to go back and <laughs> Like, I'm actually not qualified to comment on elephant rights, but I'll be ready though. next time. Okay, okay. And we'll take you up okay. on that. Please go to your next question. <laughs> the next topic I want to hit on is the government uh, governor position. Okay. So we have Mayor of Dayton, Nan uh, Whaley, mm -hmm. who's running against Dewine's re-election. Right. What, how, what direction do you think that's going to go in? Well, I think this is going to depend entirely on how how Republicans are feeling about DeWine. Kind of, I, I use the term post-COVID loosely because it's not we're not done. But you know what I'm saying. <laughs> um, not that I think Republicans would vote for Whaley, but they might stay home. Um, so that happens sometimes. If if voters don't like either candidate, you know, then they won't vote. Um, 
so, but sometimes time passes and voters forget about what upset them. Um, so, why, why were Republican voters so upset with DeWine? What do you think caused that? I mean, isn't he the standard bearer? He was, he was in the U.S. Senate for 20 years. Mm -hmm. He was the Ohio Attorney General for 10 years. Yeah. And he was, uh, you know, some would say a successful governor for four years. Why were they so against him? Well, I mean, I, I want to know exactly. Okay, that. no, I got it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, first, I would say that he would—he is not alone among establishment Republicans right. yeah. to face um, to face kind of challenges from people who you would assume that they would be supportive and right, they're not. Right. Um, I I think that. You know, especially early on in the pandemic, he took a a very conservative, not political, you know, but conservative, conservative um, approach in dealing with um, with the the risk that we faced with COVID. He support he, the precaution. Yes, you know, he he wanted to be careful and cautious, and I think that you know, among among certain subsets of the population that felt um, like an infringement on individual rights. And there were people who thought that, you know, he was overstepping. I mean, my goodness, I, I remember seeing in the news um, when uh, Dr. Amy Acton had, didn't she have people in her yard? And, yeah, you know, yeah. people just, and and the thing is, you know, what, what the governor was dealing with was, you know, a policy response to a, a health crisis. And, you know, to have that responsibility is really hard to imagine. Um, and so his approach was to try to dial back the risk as much as possible. And that was the priority. And, uh, it, and it was based on public health law that had been established over the course of a hundred years. Uh, and the backlash was, uh, you know, the, uh, you're abridging my freedoms mm -hmm. backlash. Right. Oh. Well, and what's, from a political the, or a political science standpoint, I would say what's frustrating about that, because then there were efforts to remove executive authority over those types of issues, to increase legislative authority, and to me that just seemed very reactive based on one issue and some people being upset with how another person handled that issue. Whereas I would rather see it be a discussion over what is a legitimate executive power, what is a legitimate legislative power. But this, I think, was more about, you know, this person's not doing what we want, maybe these people will do what we want. Um, so, so I think, you know, it'll depend on how voters kind of reflect back on that. And that can go both ways because I think that you could have Democratic voters who maybe feel supportive of the job he's done as governor, mm -hmm. the way he handled um, COVID, uh, again, particularly in the early months, and they may feel some, you know, because we've had this shared trauma, really, for lack of a better word. You know, we've gone through this this very impactful um, experience, and he was the governor through it. So voters might feel a sense of loyalty, you know, even if they wouldn't have typically voted for him as a Republican, they might feel like, this has been our governor, and I feel like he's done a good job, and so I want to give him my Those vote. Those sound like Reagan Democrats. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting, interesting. Jesse, did you have any questions you wanted to ask? Um, it was more on like the gerrymandering of congressional districts and like how you think that the redraw continuous redrawing of the map is going to play out, but I don't know if Andrew That was, you were yeah, thinking that of that question too, so you were okay. of, of like minds on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you, you as well. <laughs> I mean, it certainly has been something to, to watch and ponder. Who would have thought? that, you know, the Republican majority, the gerrymandered Republican majority in the Ohio State House would defy the state constitution that was broadly supported by the Ohio electorate uh, in that the electorate voted by a 70% margin to end gerrymandering. 
So I'll let you talk. Okay, yeah. So this has been a bit of a roller coaster for me personally because, I, again, I think gerrymandering is one of the major challenges that we face in American politics today. So when the voters passed, you know, those ballot issues, not only to um, redraw legislative districts, but also congressional districts, I was elated. It because, was thoughtful legislation. Yes. It was thoughtful and it was... It was the, the people did it. Yes, which I think was important because one of the challenges that we have faced historically with gerrymandering and actually trying to address the problem is that historically both parties have benefited from it. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to motivate people who benefit from the status quo to change it. And, and so that's always been a challenge. So the fact that these... Um, originated with the people, you know, and were voted on, I, I was so happy to see that because I, I do think ultimately we just want, I say we generously, want fair elections. You know, we want the outcomes of the elections to reflect the will of the people voting in that election. Um, so I was very happy. So, okay, so first I was sad because so we have gerrymandered districts and I was happy because it seemed that there was a path. To, to drawing our districts, our legislative and congressional districts, in a way that would be fair and would reflect more closely the popular vote in the state. And then, and then this process started. And what has been so unsettling for me, again, is not, not with any design on one outcome or, or another, but the idea of not following the rules, not following the laws in place, not following a process that was created in good faith to generate a fair outcome. And I think just, you know, for me, and as a voter and a resident of the state and, and someone who, who values um, fair elections and fairly drawn districts, it's just, it's been upsetting, you know, it's like, it how, is how is this happening, you it know, why, why can't, why can't we get this right, especially with the entire country watching, <laughs> you know, why can't we get this right? And when you don't have fair districts, you end up with compromised office holders mm -hmm. who couldn't win or might not be able to win without the edge, the advantage, of having a tilted district that is in their favor. Uh, and so you have a weaker legislature. Um, how do you think this, when, uh, first off, when does it end? And how do you think it ends? And, and is, is the uh, Supreme Court Chief Justice going to be able to ride it out and be a part of that ending? Well, I think ultimately there has to be some accountability. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if we're saying, like, these are the rules of the road and this, was, this is what has to happen, then apparently, you know, if, if the players involved aren't willing to do what has been asked, then, then there has to be some type of accountability. Who's going to hold them accountable? The voters? You think voters will hold them accountable? Well, that's difficult in gerrymandered <laughs> districts. Um, but, but I mean, I guess I, I would think that the, the state Supreme Court, you know, has, has some tools. Um, but they have to get it done this year. Yeah. Because uh, Maureen O'Connor, I, I think, is the Chief Justice now. She retires at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And she is the four to three vote. And if they're able to replace her with a, a malleable judge, then I don't know what happens then. Then, then it's okay to defy the law because the court's going to rule in their favor. Just, you know. But maybe that's the opportunity. I mean, if, if voters would take that opportunity, right. that would be a window. Do you, think, do you think voters know what's happening? I don't know. Um, I mean, I know we've, we've said it over and over and over in our news pages, but... I don't know if they, and it's a hard thing to explain. Um, yes, it, it is. And it's, it's one of those topics, and, and we have a few of these in political science, that it's, it's so like integral to the functioning and understanding of politics, but it's one that, yeah, isn't, isn't something that's generally it's well known. It's not glamorous. No. It, it takes a little 
a time to understand exactly what there's no buzzwords for this gerrymandering it's like what is gerrymandering yeah not not a great buzzword Read that's what we needed <laughs> what is redistricting <laughs> right well and even when i teach this subject you know it's like yeah we have to kind of move towards it in steps because i can't just yeah. open with here's gerrymandering it's like first we have to talk about congressional districts and then we have to talk about apportionment and the census and then we have to talk about you know how the districts are drawn and and then how they can be drawn to create an unfair electoral advantage and um you know i actually i have a youtube video um jesse might remember this with jungle animals <laughs> that elephants? it's there may be some elephants um but really it's you know that shows how you can have the exact same breakdown in the popular vote, but depending on how you draw those districts, you can have a vastly different outcome with regard to representation. But again, it's it's not something you can explain in one step. No. It's a multi-step explanation. And I think no. anything that falls in that category, it's automatically harder yeah, to find the buzzword, to capture an audience that's going to get it, you know, and understand how significant this is it is significant too and, and and it's it's going to end this year at some point and then we're going to bring it back up at some point because it's the law mm -hmm. so the you know stay tuned right you know i wanted to ask you about you know your students um what is their i mean do you see a change in the level of enthusiasm or the level i mean because you know, I've been watching politics all my life. I, I, I can remember, you know, wanting Hubert Humphrey to win the 1968 election. That's how old I am. Uh, and I was 10. So I've been watching this all my life. And I, had, I was always enthusiastic. I was always trying to figure out who's the good guy and who's the bad guy. And it wasn't Democrat and Republican. It was, you know, uh, the, the person, uh, certainly the person. Um, but what is it like today? Because it seems to me uh, that it is uh, demoralizing uh, and that it is sad and that people are fearful for, for democracy. Mm -hmm. But what are your students telling you? What kind of feedback are you getting from students, from young people? Well, I would say more so now than in the past, there is a level of apprehension mm -hmm. coming into my class because they don't know what it's going to be. Like, what is this? Because for many students who aren't necessarily political or exposed to politics, all they see or hear is the particularly ugly stuff because yeah. that's what bubbles up. And so, so they're coming into class, I would say more so now than in the past, with this idea that politics and the discussion of politics is going to be unpleasant uh, you know it it's, it's gonna be something that they don't necessarily want to engage in so I would say more so now I have that a little bit of an obstacle at the beginning of the semester because I have to say okay whatever you think about the study of politics whatever you think this course is gonna be like let me tell you what what my approach is mm -hmm. and what this is going to be like mm -hmm. and once once we get past that level of apprehension um, what I've been finding, especially the last few semesters, is students expressing, I think, a little bit of relief that they're in a space where we can talk. Mm -hmm. and, and we can talk about issues. Um, I do, usually in my American government class, we do a discussion board each week on a current event issue. And so we're still covering everything we need to cover, but we're doing some application. Mm -hmm. and, and we talk about controversial topics. Um, and But my goal is always just to create a comfortable space and students have been enthusiastic about having that space mm -hmm. where they can say something and no one's gonna come down on them you know because of course I insist on a respectful atmosphere does it, but does I, it uh, does it get out of hand at all or does it get you know edgy not really. Um, every once in a while you know someone will offer a comment that is maybe a bit provocative um, but I think over the years I've gotten pretty good at managing those right, right, and right. and can keep the discussion and anticipate you know, how productive and constructive and head them off at the past yeah. well but you know what though when that happens I, I really as long as we can can keep the discussion moving in a constructive way 
I don't mind it, you know, because we're going to hear, hear all kinds of, of comments and positions and views. And, and that's one thing that I stress in my class is really let's air it all out, mm -hmm. you know, especially mm -hmm. with some of the, the issues that we talk about. Like, let's air out both sides um, and, and, then, and then you figure out where you land. So, so that's how, you know. So you don't try to get them to land where you want them No, to and that, you know, people might be surprised to learn that. But yeah, no, well, I, I don't. You're a professor at a liberal arts college. You I am. must be trying to direct. No, that's me showing my politics. <laughs> no, but you know what? That that is a, a real issue, though. And I, I take it very seriously in the way I represent myself, my discipline, and my profession. That my job is to equip students with the information they need to make their own decisions. And I, I. I have a hard enough time making my own decisions. I don't need to teach, you know, tell you how to make your decisions. But I want, I want my students to make informed decisions. And isn't that, you know, the majority of people in your yes. profession, the yes. vast majority of people in your profession, it is not something other than that. It's not, it's not uh, nefarious. It's yeah. not a a radical indoctrination. Is there a lot of radical indoctrination going on at Firelands College, do you know? I can tell you I have not witnessed any radical indoctrination. And, and, and Jesse, you're, you're a college student. Is, is there a lot of radical indoctrination going on at Miami University? And, and Angela, is there a lot of radical indoctrination no. going on at main campus, Bowling Green? No. No. Did you have any other questions? Um, I wanted to touch just on your opinion about the second primary that we're um, having in August. Mm -hmm. And Frank LaRose, Secretary of State, has mentioned that he's wary about there being a lower voter turnout because it's the summer months, people aren't necessarily thinking to vote, mm -hmm. they're going on vacations while their kids are out of school. What, what do you think that voter turnout will be, in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, I think he's right to be concerned. I think that, yeah, we don't vote in August. We no one thinks August. August, let's go vote. Um, yeah, I mean, I, that, that's no doubt. Uh, will be an uphill <laughs> struggle. Um, you know, it, it's hard enough to get people to come out and vote in a regularly scheduled primary. So no, I think that concern is is real and legitimate. And, um, you know, it's, it's going to really push heavier than normal on candidates to um, raise awareness. But to your point, I, the traveling piece could be significant, you know, because if people aren't planning ahead, you know, they vacation in August, they don't usually have to worry about missing an election in August, you know, they may not think to vote early or secure an absentee ballot. So there may be some work to do there just to raise voter awareness, you know, so that they utilize some of those other options but yeah I I'll be very curious to see um, you know what what turnout is but I, I do think there's cause for concern well in the August primaries for state offices yeah. the, the legislature basically and so I, I can't let you go without asking you about the 89th house district okay. which is Erie County and Ottawa County and we have an incumbent uh, DJ Swearingen who is supportive of the don't say gay bill uh, which would uh, limit discussion of, uh, you know, controversial issues, what they're terming controversial issues in schools, would mm -hmm. regulate uh, teaching in schools. And then on the other side is the Democrat, is Jim Obergefell, mm -hmm. who is effectively the man who uh, took his court case to the Supreme Court and won a ruling from the, the United States Supreme Court that legalized gay marriage. Mm -hmm. So that would seem to me also, even though it's a statewide race, this could be a race that defines the nation that, and also grabs the nation's attention. Do you mm -hmm. think that's accurate? And, and what do you think that race will be like? Well, I think, I think you're right. It's, it's kind of a, an interesting um, kind of combination of factors. Typically, I mean, for probably for worse, people don't tend to get too tied up yeah. in a state race. But, but I think you're right, though, that those issues you outline are likely to get more attention. Um, I, I think it is a, definitely a, an interesting contrast um, in, in positions. And, and you're right that also 
races of this nature don't typically have any type of national significance. But because of the nature of the issues at hand, I think everything's kind of, um, you know, tying into a, a national audience. Do you think out-of-state money will come into play in that race? I, d I don't know why it wouldn't. Yeah, it would seem be, it would seem to be like the litmus test. Mm -hmm. uh, on the right, you have uh, Republicans who don't want you to say the word gay because uh, effectively that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And on the left, you have people who support uh, civil rights for everyone, mm -hmm. and and that is a pitched battle. Well, and Obergefell has a national profile he because of the nature national. of the Supreme Court case. So I so it really is a very unique race and set of circumstances that we have the privilege of being right in the middle of. So yeah. we'll <laughs> so we'll keep our, our eye on that race and all the races we've talked about. I want to thank you so much for being on the program again. And we'll get you back before the, the election uh, in November. Sure. And we'll talk about maybe election night. Yep, that would be great. Angela, thank you so much for being on the program. Jesse, thank you so much for being here as well. Aaron, thank you. And to our studio audience of, I'd say there's about 500 people out there. What do you think? I think so. Or six. <laughs> yes. I don't know. Five or 600. <laughs> thank you so much for being with us. This has been Between the Lines Live. It's SandusküRegister.com. You can watch all our segments of Between the Lines at uh, the Register's YouTube channel and at SandusküRegister.com.